Father, we thank you for the word tonight. We come before this, we come before the word and before heaven tonight. Opening our hearts and minds to hear from heaven, revelation from heaven, words that move heaven on the earth. And we thank you for the privilege of all of us gathering together around your name, Lord Jesus, and particularly from all over this planet gathered together in your name together. And we praise you and we thank you for it. Yes, sir, and tonight we pray for our president we hold him up to you and we thank you and praise you. We remind you again where the United States Embassy is in Jerusalem. No other president had the, had the, the nerve to just go do it. Glory to God. And we praise you and thank you for him. In Jesus name, Amen. You agree with that? Say amen. amen. Now, it is necessary from time to time to go back to the fundamentals of faith. I was invited to, uh, to preach in a, a church in Canada. And, uh, well, John and Carol are not, and I'd never, I'd never met them. And, and, and later just, I, I mean, we were part of that group that had been invited, uh, to have a, a time with, with Pope Francis and, uh, and just, I mean, we just fell in love with one another. But they, they, invite, they, they called me and said, look, uh, we need you to come teach faith, teach us faith. We, we need this. And we realize that, that we, we've, we, we've majored in praise and glory and, and the fire of God. And that's what caused this great, this great outpouring right here in Toronto. The great Toronto blessing. It was just phenomenal. Nine, nine people going to church 24 hours a day. And, uh, and so I went to the Lord and the Lord said, uh, what are you going to do? I said, well, I'm going to teach him faith. He said, don't you begin teaching them where you are now. They won't understand half of what you say. Go back to the fundamentals. Go back to the A, B, C. Right. He said, you go back at where you learned it. I said, yes, sir. So what did I do? Out came my head. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I realized I had let that slip. I said, I'm not doing that anymore. And I haven't. Amen. Amen. I mean, instead of watching television or anything else, and Gloria and I, we go to bed, out comes that iPad. I've got a little wooden rack, just set that thing in there. And here we go. Amen. I'll tell you something funny. What, there was a message that he had preached um, there in uh, the church where Ken Jr. was, was pastor and still is. And, um, but he said something about Buddy Harrison, his son-in-law, about his home going. Buddy died of cancer. And he had, he said something about that. And I, and I, and I heard about it and I thought, I really would like to hear that. So, 
So we brought it up on YouTube and I had the, the iPad sitting up there in the bed, you know, and we, we watched that whole service. Well, of course, when he started giving the invitation, well, you know, we turned it off, but it was still on. <laughs> I leaned over there to kiss Gloria good night. And she said, not in front of brother Hagen. <laughs> that woman, you can <laughs> The ABCs, the fundamentals of faith. Fundamentals, I am going to open my Bible to the 11th chapter of the Gospel of Mark. You do realize that, don't you? <laughs> if yours is like mine, it kind of falls open there. <laughs> and um, now, Why Why is God so interested? Why is Jesus so interested in teaching, preaching, talking about faith? Faith is a spiritual force. We've talked about this a lot of times, many times, but I'm going to take a, a moment and, and touch on it again because it is the basic fundamental of it. Fear is a spiritual force. Fear, Adam's faith he was disconnected from God and spiritually connected to the devil. His faith became fear. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. We know that. But fear comes by hearing and hearing by the words of the devil. That's right. When he realized what he had done, the King James is, it's really not good here. The King James said, where are you? That's not what he said. And Professor Stevens pointed this out to me, what the Hebrew says, why are you where you are? He was, he hid himself. The fear came by hearing, Gary, hearing God's voice. It, it frightened him. He, well, he didn't, he didn't know what was happening to him. So fear and faith are actually the same thing. Fear is faith in something dangerous. It's, of course, my being a pilot all these years, uh, that, that, that compass rose comes up in my thinking every time I think about this. So I'm going one direction. The reciprocal of that is just the opposite direction. So if I'm going north and I turn around, I'm going south. They are both directions of the same compass but one is exactly opposite the other. Faith is exact opposite of fear. Amen. So that's vital information when it comes to talking about faith. But now that's, that, that's, that's not all of it. Think about this now. When, once, and here, here too, once you know the fundamentals of faith, you know the fundamentals of fear. I mean, you, you already know because they work exactly the same, exactly 180 degrees opposed to one another. So, Hebrews 11:6. It is impossible to please God without faith. It's impossible to please God anyone without faith. 
You've heard me say it before. I'm going to say it again. Um, I walk up to Gloria and say, Gloria, I love you so much. I just don't believe anything you say. What? (laughs) You better duck when you say it. That is very displeasing. I love you, but I don't believe anything you say. Now I met, I used to be one. I lied for fun to see if I could get somebody to believe it because I wanted to be an actor. It's just stupid. I look back on it now and people say, well, you can't look somebody in the eye. So I got in front of the mirror and practiced it. So I could just lie and look you right in the face. What was it? What is that? Actually, that's a singe to conscious. Mm. Conscious. It, it, and I'm like that little boy in Sunday school. And the teacher said, what is a lie? He said, it's an abomination to God and an ever present help in a time of need. <laughs> So it's impossible to please him without faith. You can't live the Christian life without it because the just live by faith. And you heard Brother Hagin, Brother Brother Jerry say that today. Faith is not a movement. It is a lifestyle. Faith people, people that live by faith, walk by faith and know it all the time, conscious of it all the time. We never have to change our lifestyle because of the times. Because we were believing God when it got here and we believe in God when it left. It's just like we were talking about those, those years that weren't so hot and those that were, we believe in God the whole time. Amen. We were in Steamboat Springs right when I'm that really raunchy recession hit 83. Oh, it was, man, it was, it was just awful. And I had my partner letter on my mind. I'm thinking about my partner letter now. And we had gone skiing that morning and oh, it was just gorgeous up there in the mountains. And, and, the, and the, the, the lift stopped and and it, particularly when it, when it stops out there hanging over a, a high valley, I really like that. And all of the mountains and all of that. And I heard it so plain. The word of the Lord came to me. I'm praying in the spirit the whole time I'm up there about my partner letter because it's coming up and I'm gonna write this thing. I'm like, what am I gonna say to my partners? And they said, tell your partners so don't ju- not to join in on the recession. It doesn't belong to them. <laughs> don't join in. Amen. Just don't join in. In other words, stay on your faith. So you can't fight the Christian fight. We fight the good fight of faith. You can't get saved without it in the second chapter of the book of Ephesians. We're saved by faith through grace. And somebody said to me one time, it is the gift of God. And they said, Brother Copeland, which one of those were the gift of God? I said, both of them. You (laughs) You got to pick. (laughs) Now listen to this. Listen to this one. Therefore, it is of faith, fourth chapter of the book of Romans, therefore it is of faith so that it might be by grace. So that it might be by grace. On one airplane that I trained on, one jet airplane that I trained on, it, (laughs) you had um, DC, direct current generators. But there was a, there was a 
a converter in there that had to do with the, the de-icing system and so forth. And one of the ways you, you learned this particular system was no DC, no AC because you had to have that direct current to start with. You had to have something to convert to AC or you don't get there. No faith, no, no grace. You soon want to get caught without grace ever. No faith, no grace. Hallelujah. Well, what else? What else can you think of? You can't overcome the world without it. This is the victory that overcometh the world. Even Even our faith. Faith. Whose faith? Our, our faith. faith. My faith. Right. My faith. Now you know why we're the victory channel. Years and years, I'm talking about, well, we have been in this, this ministry 84 years here in, uh, in, in January. And I don't know, this, this was so far back. It was just right at the very, very beginning. And I had all my outlines. I'm, I did my outlines just like I do them now. And um, I had them all out on the bed in the motel. And I, I remember having each one of them out here like this. And I said, now, Lord, uh, he said, this is, he, he said, what, what does my word say? This is the victory that overcometh the world. He said, doesn't my word say that I gave you victory over death? I gave you victory over grave. I gave you victory over hell. He said, didn't my word say that? I said, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Well, he said, there's victory in the new birth. There's victory in the baptism of the Holy Ghost speaking with other tongues. There's victory. Right then he said, every believer has a voice and it is the voice of victory. He said, I want you to teach victory in the new birth. You overcame, you teach victory. Just you teach faith. You teach victory, 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 victory. That's when I, this got started. And I might as well just take up this whole package. Where did this from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around the middle, where did that came from? came from. That sounds good, doesn't it? Uh -huh. <laughs> he haven't came yet. Well, yeah, that's all right. <laughs> I get excited talking about faith. Brother Hagen. I keep coming over here because these are Haganites and, and Oral Robertsites and <laughs> He started saying, he learned, I have what I say. And he said, I'm going to preach that Jesus saves, that Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Spirit, and he is the soon coming king. And I'm going to preach it from El Paso to Texarkana and from Amarillo to Brownsville. He said, if I covered Texas, I think I'm doing something here. But then he said, I began to expand. I'm going to preach it that Jesus saves, Jesus heals, Jesus baptizes with the Holy Ghost and he's our soon coming king. And I'm going to preach it from the, 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 the Northwest to the Northeast from the top of the United States to the bottom. And then he said, I spread out and I'm going to preach it to Canada. Glory to God. And I took hold of that. I said, well, glory to God. I'm going to start saying that. Now I was sitting, I had a little table. Oh, it was so little. The whole, the, the whole little house was so little. <laughs> oh. And uh, so I had this little table I was using for a desk. 
Now, when I was a boy, particularly in grade school, you had book covers. Well, I drew airplanes all over my book covers. I mean, this just, 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 my daddy said, if I could break your head open and just be motorcycles and airplanes jump out. And I said, yeah, that's right. <laughs> yeah. And I found out later I was called to fly. And I told you that story, but, and I was just doodling and just doodling and, and, and I read, <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Yes. Uh, whosoever shall confess it, that Jesus is Lord. No man says Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Ghost. Jesus is Lord. 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 I just doodled it all over, uh, all, all over my scrap paper and just Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Jesus. Well, Jesus is Lord. He's Lord from the top of the world to the bottom. He's, he's Lord. He's Lord. He's, he's Lord. And I drew this little globe and I put Jesus is Lord. And I had this little airplane flying around the, right around the equator, all the way around the middle. So I started saying it. I'm going to preach this gospel. I'm going to preach that Jesus saves. I'm going to preach that Jesus heals. I'm going to preach that Jesus is our soon coming King. I'm going to preach that Jesus is our financier. Glory to God, yes. that he is our Melchizedek. I'm going to preach it from the top of this world to the bottom. And I'm going to preach it all the way around the middle. And by the grace and glory of God, we've been able to do that. Praise God. We've been able to do that. Amen. Amen. Preached it so far north in Canada. We did a, we did a couple of weeks tour in Canada <laughs> and just preaching a word of faith. And there, there was a woman that called and wanted to talk to me. So they gave that anyway, they put me on a phone with them. The cell phone, you can't, what's a cell phone? That's a phone in a jail or something. No, <laughs> there was no cell phone. And uh, so uh, anyway, got her on the phone. She said, Brother Copeland, I've been a partner for a long time. Would you come up to our village and preach? I said, well, uh, uh, we're on this tour. She said, listen, we really, we really need you to come. I said, okay, where are you? She said, we're in village, what was it, Lord? 58, I think. <laughs> it was a number on a map. Actually, it was part of the lat long. She was so far north. Now, we were back in the day we had an airplane called a Jetstar, Lockheed Jetstar. And to go, to go direct across, like to go to Hawaii, you just had to get certain winds, winds just right, or you just couldn't get there. There's just too much headwind. But we found out from some, from medical people that you could just go a little bit north up to Seattle and then right on up to the Lucian Islands, right there at the tip of the Lucian Islands to Coal Bay, which was a refueling stop during World War II and it, it still is today. And uh, so <laughs> we were actually headed on we were, we went up there and then, then going due South. And then we were going, we were going on to, to the Pacific, Central Pacific. And we preached in, on a little Island called Ebi. Anyway, we walked and it, it was, it was cold there. And, um, so we walked through the back of the, the hangar to get in the fuel office, get out of the wind. 
And so we were just standing there at the fuel desk waiting so I could sign the, the uh, credit card. And this woman walked in there and she went, ah, and turned around and ran out. Well, Jesse standing there, I turned around and said, what'd you say? He said, I didn't say anything. <laughs> and she came back in there. She said, oh, please forgive me, you guys. Nobody told me you were coming here. She said, we watch you on television all the time. And she said, you know, it's dark up here about half of the year and it's daylight half of the year. She said, you, we just pick out of whatever time we want, whether it's night or day, we just, we just, we go in and we watch the broadcast in cold Bay, Alaska. I started saying it. Well, last year, glory to God, Jerry and Jesse and I preached on Guadalcanal in the Solomon Islands. Hallelujah. Dream of mine. I'm a student of World War II and particularly the, Guad the Guadalcanal campaign because that was a big turning point for American forces. And, and then uh, here I am in Honiara, in Guadalcanal, preaching the word of faith. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And preached it in Colombia, which is right on the equator. Yeah. Preached it in Venezuela and preached it in Australia Amen. and New Zealand. Yes, Glory to God. Yes, so God has blessed us to be able to do that yes. from the top of the world to the bottom and all the way around the middle to preach the word of faith. Amen. Amen. The, the, the very fundamentals of faith. Now, <clears throat> well, let me give you these so you can write them down because we won't be able to cover them all tonight. <clears throat> Number one, the, the number one fundamental of faith. You believe it in your heart, then you say it with your mouth. Now, the phrase, the word of faith, which we preach is in the 10th chapter of the book of Romans. <clears throat> with the heart, man believes and with the mouth, let's just turn there. 10th chapter of the book of Romans. Don't lose your place there in Mark 11. <clears throat> Verse six, the righteousness which is of faith speaketh. The righteousness which is of faith speaks on this wise. Say not in your heart, who shall ascend into heaven? That is to bring Christ down from above. Or who shall descend into the deep? That is to bring Christ again from the dead. What does it say? The word is nigh thee, even in your mouth and in your heart. That is the word of faith, which we preach in your heart and in your mouth, in your heart and in your mouth. The word of faith, which we preach that if you shall confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus or Jesus is Lord and shall believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Actually, the word is sozo. You shall be saved, you shall be healed. Same word, means exactly the same thing. <clears throat> That's an interesting word study sometimes. Just, just, just read through particularly the, the, the letters, and find that word sozo. It's an eye opener in the healing ministry. It would have stopped small wars <laughs> and people just know, what to, well, healing passed away. Well, sozo passed away. Think of that. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> for, here it is, with the heart, with the spirit, the inner man, believes unto righteousness 
and with the mouth confession is made unto sozo, unto salvation. Heart and mouth. You believe it in your heart, then say it with your mouth. Now then, <coughs> excuse me. <coughs> Let's go to the book of Matthew. Have, let, me, let me finish reading this in, in Mark 11, 23. Have the faith of God, have the God kind of faith. For verily I say unto you that whosoever shall say unto this mountain, be thou removed and be thou cast into the sea, shall not doubt in his heart, but believe that those things which he says, those words that he says, will come to pass, he shall have whatsoever he saith, therefore I say. So he put it into operation immediately. Therefore I say unto you, what things soever you desire when you pray, when you pray, believe that you receive and you will have. And you've heard Gloria say this many, 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 many times. That word translated receive is exactly the word that means to take. Well, of course it does. The only time people don't understand that is in church. <laughs> receive, take, same thing. Every passer needs a good receiver. My son, Jonathan, is a quarterback and a good one, but he's no better than the receiver. Now, Jonathan is one of those young men, the, his, um, eye hand coordination is just really good. I'm not just cause he's my grandson. I mean, I'm, I'm quoting his press. He's just one of those guys and he's totally committed himself to that game. And he, he believes God has called him and he has, has called him into that field to coach and to, to, to be a part of, of young, young men and their spiritual growth. So he was just as good a basketball player as he was a football player. And so he, but he just walked away from it. His coach cried when he quit basketball. So did his, so, so did his mother. <laughs> no, he said, I, I must concentrate on this. This is what God called me to do. I must concentrate on this, on, on, on this. This is what I must do. So, he and his receiver have to practice together because when that ball is anywhere close, that receiver has to take that thing. Amen. Amen. He has to take it. I got to take this. And Gloria said it isn't yours till you take it. And believe you take it. Believe you have it. Believe you receive it. And when you stand praying, forgive if you have ought against any. All of that is one statement. This is fundamentals of faith. And I've had, I've had people say this to me, not in a long time, but uh, particularly back in the early days when so many people had never heard anything like this about, well, <clears throat> now Brother Copeland, uh, that was a spiritual mountain and uh, a spiritual fig tree. Really? Well, let's check that out in the 21st chapter of Matthew, the 21st verse. Jesus answered and said unto them, Verily I say unto you, if you have faith and doubt not, you shall not only do that which is done to this fig tree. You shall not only do that that was done to this fig tree, but you say to that mountain, praise God, that settled that question. Now then, and of course we've, we've already covered some of these, <clears throat> these other places in the book of Romans and so forth. 
faith. Now then, Mark chapter 5. <clears throat> now, I'll go ahead and give you background on this. <clears throat> Those of you that are not familiar, if there is anybody that's not. Kenneth Hagin was born in August of 1917, extremely prematurely. They were, they were frightened for the life of his mother. And that's obvious they induced labor thinking that she's, she's gonna die and we're gonna lose her and a baby too. So, <clears throat> and he was born and his grandmother, his grandfather was a doctor on the other side of the family. And so she had worked with him so much and, and had been a nurse to him that she was, you know, she, she really knew what she was doing. And uh, <clears throat> thank you, excuse me. He was so small when he was born, fully dressed, he weighed less than two pounds. Just supernaturally that he lived. And it went to suggest the route that they said it would. They said, you'll, you'll, then you'll get paralyzed, you'll get to where you can't see, and then you'll, you'll die. And he said, I knew somehow, some way, that it was right there in that 11th chapter of Mark. I, I, I knew that, that my, my, my healing was there. He said, I, 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 I dealt with that for 17 months. or excuse me, 16 months on that bed. And he said, I finally saw it. I finally saw it. I have to believe it before I have it. I have to believe that it's mine. I have to believe when I pray that I'm healed, not after I feel something that I'm healed. Anybody can believe that. I have to believe it now while I'm paralyzed. I have to believe it now while I can just barely see. <clears throat> and finally that morning, that morning in 1934, the Lord said, so you believe you're healed. He said, I sure do. He said it out loud, I sure do. He said, heal people ought to be up this time of day. <laughs> so he said, I started getting up. And he said, I couldn't feel anything from the waist down. And so he said, I, I worked myself over onto the side of the bed and he said, my hands were partially paralyzed. And he said, I just, just threw my legs out on the floor. Now he's just skin and bones. Now fully dressed, he only weighed 89 pounds. And, but he just threw his legs out. He said, I couldn't feel it when they hit the floor, just like two chunks of wood. And he said, I slid off of there. And he said, I grabbed around the bedpost. And he said, I want to announce <laughs> to Almighty God, to the Lord Jesus Christ, all the angels in this room and every devil in hell, I'm healed. Praise God. I'm healed. I'm healed. 
And he said, all of a sudden I began to get feeling in my legs. And he said, he said it, it, it he said it hurt so bad. He said it felt like 10,000 needles being stuck in my, he said, those nerves are coming back to life. And he said, I began to cry. And he said, I'm, I'm he said, I'm, I'm crying cause I can feel it. I'm crying cause I can feel it. And I cause it, he said, it hurt good. And his heart that just didn't beat right at all. His doctor told him, for you to live, we would have to replace everything in your chest, your heart, your lungs, all your plumbing. He asked him, he said, why is it if I drink something cold, it goes in, but he said, I feel it coming all the way over here before it goes to my stomach. He said, you, 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 you didn't completely, you're so deformed on the inside. Think about what a miracle that was. And he believed it in his heart and he said it with his mouth. And in a moment's time, he was standing up with his arms up, praising God, walking around that room. Walking around the room. Now he was in a meeting, and uh, there was the, it was after the service, and the 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 pastor and his wife and the, their family and and all of them all faith people and they've been in the meeting and all of them together there. And he said, just the strongest, just the urge, just an, almost a burden to pray. And he told them, he said, I've got to pray and I've got to pray now. They said, all right, we'll just pray with you. And he said, we just, everybody just hit the floor and started praying in the spirit. And he said, I know, he said, my knees hit that floor and there was Jesus in the spirit. And he started talking to me and he talked to me about some things. And, and then, he, and then, he, then I said, uh, Lord Jesus, I want to ask you about a couple of my messages. He said, all right. He said, the woman with the issue of blood, I, I, I've got a message here about her and her saying it and, and so forth. And I, seems like I'm missing part of that message. He said, you are. <laughs> and he said something like, uh, my spirit's been trying to get this over to you for quite some time. And he said, uh, write this down. Well, he said, I had to, he said, I went into my bedroom. I was staying in the parsonage there with the pastor. And he said, I went in the bedroom and he said, I got pencil in just a card there. And he said, I still have it. But he said, I got back there and got on my knees and there was Jesus. And he said, now write down these four things. And he said, it's amazing how well you can write with your eyes shut when you're in the spirit. <laughs> One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. She, number one, the Lord said, number one, she said it. Number two, she did it. Weymouth translation of the New Testament in the book of James calls for corresponding action. She did it. She said it. She believed it. She did it. And she told it. He said, anybody, any of my children at any time that will do these things can receive anything they want or anything they need from me. 
Just those four things. She said it, she believed it, she did it, and she told it, she testified to it. Those four things. So when we, let, let's go there now. And faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. In the fifth chapter of the book of Mark, verse 25, a certain woman which had an issue of blood for 12 years, she's been shut in for 12 years and had suffered many things of many physicians and had spent all that she had and was nothing bettered, but rather grew worse when she had heard of Jesus, came in the press behind and touched his garment. She touched his prayer shawl. She touched his garment for she said, if I may touch his clothes, I shall be whole. And straightway, immediately, the fountain of her blood was dried up and then she felt in her body that she was healed of that plague. Amen. So now she heard of Jesus. Well, like I said this morning in our partner service, he preached that sermon, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor and so forth and so on. Poor man, you don't have to be poor anymore. I'm here. Blind man, you don't have to be blind anymore. I'm here. Captive man, drug addict, you don't have to be bound up and captive anymore. I'm here. And he preached the acceptable year of the Lord, which was supernatural debt cancellation. So there you have it. <laughs> Teach, priest, and heal. <laughs> Amen. She heard that. She, she's got someone relaying messages because he lives right down the street. He lives in Capernaum and this was in Capernaum. And he, you know, they've had scouts out looking for him. He's got, he's got to come home sometime. And well, when he does, we love him so. So, Spencer, she must have forgiven those doctors. Hmm. Yeah. 12 years, 12 years. She's been shut in. Check it out in the book of Leviticus. Fifth, sixth, seventh chapters of the book of Leviticus. She was unclean. A woman with an issue of blood beyond her normal time, she was, she was a shut in. You couldn't go out in public. And you, you, you were considered really in the same category with a leper. You were unclean. And you just stay inside. You just don't come out here. So they, she just couldn't go out. Don't you know that got old? 12 long years, she's skin and bones, bleeding all the time. Had all that time to think about all those doctors and I used to have money and now I don't. Bunch of quacks. Obviously she didn't. She'd heard enough about hearing about Jesus to forgive. So that was not a problem in her life. She had forgiven them. And the fact that she didn't have any resources anymore. She got beyond that. If I just get my health back here and I'm going to get it back all I've got, all, all I have, I'm going to run the risk. I am going to crawl out there and there's Jairus right there. 
that's Jay Harris. He's leader of the synagogue. Maybe he won't see me either. And I'll just, I'll just, I'll just touch and I'll just skinny back <laughs> out of there. Do you remember she, well, look at it. Jesus immediately knowing in himself that dunamis had gone out of him power, turned about in the press and said, who touched my clothes? His disciples said unto him, you see the multitude throng in thee and sayest thou who touched me. He looked around about to see her that had done this thing, but the woman fearing and trembling, fearing and trembling. Now she's, I wanted to get my health back and get, you know, get my hair fixed and look a little better than I do. Now I'm a mess. And, but, but, oh man, fearing and trembling. fell down before him and told him all the truth. She told him. That's the way we know. That's the way Jesus found out that she's been shut in right there in that house for 12 years. That's the way he found out that she'd had this issue of blood. That's the way he found, that's the way he learned it. But the, wait a minute, there's another faith man standing right beside him and all of this throng and it's Jairus. And he's already said his faith never opened his mouth again. He stopped there. We have no idea how long this took. We don't know how long Boy, once she is free and talking about all those doctors and talking about her money, we don't know what, what she, she told about uh, how, how much money she had and where that, can, she, we don't know. Uh, we don't know what happened to her husband. We don't, we don't, we don't, she might've gone into some of that, but Jairus just stood there because he'd already said, you come, lay your hand on my daughter and she will live. That's all he ever said. And right there while he's talking to that woman, the death messenger came and said, don't trouble the master any longer. But wait, what did Jesus say in the 34th verse here? He said unto her daughter, thy faith, your faith has made you whole. Wait a minute. Now wait, her faith? Yes, her faith, her faith. That, that the anointing, we know that it was that healing anointing in and on Jesus that healed her body. But there were other people touching him Faith gave action to that power. The anointing of God and the faith of God are kindred forces. They work together. Amen. <laughs> Hallelujah. They work together. That, the faith of God in her reached out and activated that anointing that's in and on him. Her faith made her whole. Wait a minute. It didn't heal her. It made her whole. That means we're doing something about the financial situation that you can be healed and, and your finances still be sick and be in a worse mess. It made her whole. Amen. 
And it's just a matter of time. It's just a matter of time. Her body's supernaturally coming well again. And so she's supernaturally oh, back over in the financial world. Amen. Amen. Glory to God. Made her, her faith made her whole. So she could not have held anything against those doctors. There's no way she could have held anything against anybody whatsoever. She just had her eyes on Jesus. Isn't that good? Fundamentals of faith. Faith will not work in an unforgiving heart. Galatians 5, 6 says, faith works by love. Abraham's blessing, the third one, Abraham's blessing cannot be received with Thomas's faith. Cannot be done. Go with me to Romans 16. Oh, it's got 1 Corinthians 16, excuse me. Thank you for it, Father. Thank you, Lord Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Yes, sir, but if I, yeah. Second Corinthians 4, 13. We having the same spirit of faith, according as it is written, according as it is written, I have believed and therefore have I spoken. We also believe and therefore we speak. And now Romans 4, 17. I had the reference wrong there a moment ago, forgive me. Romans 4, Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Let's look there in the 16th verse. Wherefore, henceforth know we no man after the flesh, yea, though we have known Christ after the flesh, yet now henceforth know we him no more. Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things have passed away, and behold, all things become new, and all things are of God. Who hath reconciled us to himself by Christ Jesus, or Jesus Christ, has given unto us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, or to know, 
that God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself and not imputing or holding against them their trespasses has committed unto us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as, as God did beseech you. We pray you in Christ's stead that you be reconciled to God, that you be reconciled to God. All right. Thank you, Lord. Now, Romans chapter four, I'm going to get this straight. I had so much in here and, and anyway, uh, that may be the answer to the question, how dumb can you get? But I'm, I'm there now. <laughs> Romans chapter four, Kenneth, in the 16th verse. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace. To the end, the promise might be sure to all the seed, not to that only which is of the law, but also to that which is of the faith of Abraham, who's the father of us all, as it is written, as it is written, I have, as it is written, as it is written, did you get that? As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations before him. Cross reference there says, or like unto him. Or in other words, like God in his presence who quickeneth the dead and calleth those things as be not as though they were who against hope believed in hope that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which, which, according to that, according to that which was spoken, so shall your seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, being fully persuaded of what he'd promised he was able also to perform. I consider not my own body now almost 84 years old, but only that which God had promised me. And in Genesis 6, 3, he promised me 120 years. Amen. 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 Hallelujah. I don't care how long it took me to find Romans chapter four. <laughs> Well, it's in there somewhere. I know that. <laughs> Fundamentals of faith, Copeland. All right. Well, that's Abraham's faith. Considered not his own body, neither the deadness of Sarah's womb. Considered it not. But only that which God had promised. Being fully persuaded he is able to perform it. Fully persuaded. Absolutely fully persuaded fully persuaded. How did he get so fully persuaded? He had a blood agreement with almighty God. He was fully persuaded. He was able to perform it. Completely, totally persuaded. And that's the way we get completely, totally persuaded is when we begin to find out that I have a blood covenant with the Lord God and Jesus of Nazareth is my blood brother. He is my blood brother. My being of Native American descent, I wanted a blood brother so bad. I was an only child to start with. I wanted a blood brother. And uh, my mother, because of, well, she was on the basketball court and her appendix ruptured. I have a very, very old photograph of my mother in her basketball uniform. 
Of course, it went way down to here <laughs> and it, it had plumes and, and, she, and she had on her tennis shoes <laughs> and her headband and it said Union High School. Little old country, little old country town, I don't know whether it even exists anymore or not. Union School. And there was some debate whether or not the girls should play basketball. <laughs> After all, it's not all that ladylike. <laughs> but her, her appendix ruptured on the court. Well, of course, and, and that, uh, the, the appendix scar back there then, it, it wasn't just a little scar like, like it is now. Boy, this thing was, you know, just, she was just cut open. Well, the doctor didn't even sew her up. He just used cadaver clamps because, you know, he just cleaned her out because she got to die. Well, my mother was a prayer even then. And uh, my dad's sister and my mother were the same age and they would pray together and they'd go down the storm cellar and pray. I said, hey, Barbara, why, why did you, why did you girls, there was another one of the girls, that, and why did you go down that storm cellar? She said, Kenneth, we, we get to pray it and we get happy and start shouting. And she said, people would call us crazy. She said, they'd have sent us to, they'd have put us away someplace. <laughs> Little old girls shouting around like that, what's the matter with you? And she said, sometimes you just crawl up on the windmill where you could just shout just loud as you possibly could. And you know, people don't know what windmills are, but <laughs> a friend of mine married a girl that was all the way as far east as you could get. And he took her back to West Texas. And he was telling me in the, in the service, uh, and he, say, he said, Copeland, this was so classic. He said, I was, I was stationed there in New York and I met and married her. And so we're going out. Did you know there's actually a mule shoe, Texas? Oh yeah. And he lived in Muleshoe. And so he, <laughs> and I've been in Muleshoe and it's about as big as this room. But anyway, no, it's a, it's a little bigger than that. And he said it was absolute classic. He said, we drove straight through and we got there. The sun was just coming up and she had never seen flat country. She'd never been out of New York City. And he said, she woke up and he said, it was early. And he said, I just drove all the way down Main Street, made a U-turn and came back up just driving. He said, of course, I'm looking at all the stores and everything, I'm home. And he said, it was absolutely classic. He said, the, <laughs> the policeman pulled me over because he made a U-turn. And he, he rolled his window down and the, the policeman said, partner, you done broke the law. <laughs> he said, if I'd have scripted it, it wouldn't have been any better. And he told her those windmills were cow fans. <laughs> the cows get awfully hot out here in West Texas, you know. And so we got to, we built these big fans where it would fan the cows. When it, and we have a woman in the House of Representatives, and I won't go there, but. Uh, <laughs> she's uh, kind of taken up with cows too, you know. But anyway, <clears throat> forgive me, Lord. <laughs> anyway cow fans. <laughs> oh my goodness. That's Texas. Rick Perry. I had a very good relationship with Governor Perry. Now there had been other governors in the state of Texas that had been elected three times, but not successively, except Rick Perry. 
And he had um, a little, a little dog that, that he, when he, he jogged, get out there in the park early, early in the morning. You know, Rick was military and he was in the Air Force and he was an early riser. And particularly when the governor's office, you get up, if you're going to exercise, you're going to get up early to it. And there was a coyote in, in, a, in the park there and jumped out and jumped on his little dog. Well, he just pulled his pistol and shot the coyote. <laughs> and the news media, well, you know, they like to come on wired. <laughs> Governor, do you mean to tell me that, I don't remember the exact words, that you were carrying a firearm or something, something he said, <laughs> Welcome to Texas, boys. <laughs> I wish I'd have thought of that. <laughs> Welcome to Texas, boy. And Texas is one of the few states that not only has concealed carry, but open carry. I have a concealed carry license. But just because I like to shoot, I don't, I don't plan on carrying a gun with me. I got one and slid on there on that right there. Amen. Yeah. <laughs> I'm heavily armed, but I, I really enjoy shooting sports and I enjoyed the training and all that. And I think it's kind of cool to have that thing in my, right next to my driver's license, you know, and uh, I'll preach to you and shoot you. Not when I know I'm... <laughs> I just, I just enjoyed the training and then the whole thing, you know, but in the state of Texas, you can just strap on your guns and go right on to town. Amen. Oh, brother Copeland, isn't that dangerous? Yeah. For bad people. When those concealed carry laws went into effect, <laughs> crime went down yeah. instead of up. Cause they have no idea who has a, who has a firearm and who doesn't. Cute little purses. Yes. <laughs> Women have cute little purses. Mm -hmm. Boom. You know, <laughs> she don't look like she'd shoot me. <laughs> You get on glory and see what happens. I'm in covenant with her. I stood before her. Joe Stewart, almost 59 years ago, I entered covenant to protect her, take care of her. Amen. And I mean it. I've, I'm in covenant with her. Glory to God. And even today, if someone were to attempt to hurt her, I love her more than my own life. I love Jesus more than my own life. Amen. You get on her and I'm going to get on you. I don't care if I am 84 years old. It'd be the longest day you ever had. <laughs> Brother Copeland, would you do that? <laughs> In the New York minute, that's not but about that long. Why? I'm, I'm not saying these things just to be funny. I'm, I'm, I'm talking about God's covenant with us, our covenant with him. And men and women with good spiritual sense. I like what another thing that Bill Winston said, somebody said, well, that don't make sense. 
And Bill said, it wasn't supposed to make sense. It made faith. <laughs> it makes sense. It made faith. Thank you, Jesus. Well, again, did you get anything out of this tonight? Stand with me, please.